found time to join us in the last leg of the Medical Legal Symposium. And uh, today we have a very interesting conversation, interesting topic. We're going to talk about uh, forensic examination in medical legal cases. And this is an aspect that affects all of us as healthcare workers. When you're taking sample for a patient, if you've got a patient who's been assaulted, what evidence do you take? So that is the conversation we'll be having today. We'll also have a session on professional indemnity. And it's one of the areas that we'd like to cover as we end this uh, symposium. So I really hope uh, you'll stay tuned with us and uh, get to learn about professional indemnity for the healthcare worker. So we're going to start off with Dr. Francis Kimani from the Ministry of Health and is going to take us through a session of forensic DNA in medical legal Dr. Joseph Kimani, sorry, I apologize. Dr. Joseph sorry. Kimani. It's okay. Yes, and he's going to take us through a session of forensic DNA in medical legal cases. Yes, so Dr. Joseph Kimani, Karibu Sana, and apologies for the name. No, no, it's okay. Yes, go ahead. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I hope uh, everybody can hear me clearly. Uh, my name is... Uh, Dr. Joseph Kemani. I am the head of forensic uh, biology at the Department of uh, Government Chemist. Now, um, I think uh, Dr. Kalondu, I would need to, I don't know how, whether I can move the slides from my end. No, we'll move them from uh, our okay. end. No, okay, okay thank you, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so let, let's move to the next slide. Okay, now, um, when we talk about forensic science, we talk about the science that is applicable to, to the law. That is all the scientific principles and ethos that are used to establish facts as in relating to criminal or civil matters in, uh, before a court of law. And now, the intersection between forensic uh, science and the court of law is where we apply tools that are involved in forensic science and uh, forens forensic evidence material to be able to relate, uh, for example, a scene of crime and connect that to a possible assailant, possibly somebody who left uh, evidential material at a scene of crime and try to connect the two and trying to see whether there is a possible match. Now, one of the most uh, key and the most powerful aspects of forensic science that is applicable these days is the use of the forensic uh, DNA uh, to be able to resolve cases that are before the courts of law. Now, we understand and we know that every cell in the body uh, contains uh, DNA apart from the erythrocytes, apart from the lead blood cells. All the other cells in the body are nucleated and all nucleated cells contain uh, DNA. Now, I'd like you also to note that DNA is not only uh, found within the nucleus of a cell, there are multiple DNA that are also found within the mitochondria, and therefore that brings to us two types of DNA which are very critical. One of them is the autosomal DNA that is found in the nucleus, and the other one is the mitochondrial DNA. Now, the, the, the autosomal DNA that is found in the nucleus is the near DNA that uh, undergoes recombination. And uh, the particular one that comes from the mitochondria mm -hmm. is basically the maternal DNA. It is passed from one generation to the other one unchanged. And that those are very important aspects when it comes to forensic work. Now, in uh, doing DNA, forensic DNA work, it is important to understand that each individual has a unique pattern that uh, is generated when one is analyzes DNA and what we basically call DNA fingerprinting. So every person has a unique identifier in terms of what we call a DNA profile, unless uh, for identical twins, basically identical twins have the same DNA pattern. Go to the next slide, please. Now, when, when we look at, uh, when we look at uh, the DNA, uh, we basically recognize that DNA in the nucleus is not free DNA. It is packaged 
into what we call the chromosomes, the thread-like structures, where it is compacted uh, by histone proteins uh, to, to, to make what we call the chromatin. And that DNA is not free DNA. And we all know that uh, a normal somatic cell has 46 pairs of chromosomes. And uh, basically, uh, the sex chromosomes and the other ones are autosomes. And uh, that forms the basis of what we, we work on when it comes to the DNA uh, forensic work. Go to the next slide, please. Now, DNA, as, as I rightly said, it is present in all created cells, and therefore, there are so many sources of the uh, DNA or sources of biological evidence. That is to mean we can be able to get very good evidential material from blood, from semen, from saliva, from hair, from teeth, from bone, from tissues, name them. So we can have so many sources of DNA. Uh, you can have very good DNA from uh, uh, cigarette butts. That is a DNA from the epithelial cells of the mouth. You can have what we, we are now calling contact DNA. That is any contact that uh, employs good enough friction uh, with your epithelial cells will be able to confer a surface with the, with the DNA. So we are able to get good DNA from uh, the, uh, the armpits of the shards. We are able to get that from the color. We are able to get it from very many areas, including mobile phones that we use every, every single do, day, uh, doorknobs. There are, there are very many areas where you can get trace amount of contact DNA, and therefore those are very important and good sources of, uh, of the DNA. One other important aspect is that we are able to take advantage of even the very small minute amount of DNA, what we call trace DNA, and be able to amplify the same and get very nice biological evidence that can be introduced in court. Next slide. Now, it is important in that aspect then to be able to recognize uh, the value of physical evidence and the whole concept of uh, the chain of custody. You realize when a crime has happened, we have uh, what we call the scene of crime where the primary uh, action has taken place. And now you need to be able to pick uh, the evidence which might be in terms of microscopic amounts or or massive, massive, massive amount of evidence, you need to have very robust ways of picking that evidence. And number two, being able to preserve and to handle and transport that evidence uh, to the laboratory and the same now to be conferred to, to the court. Therefore, it is very, very important to, to understand that uh, when physical evidence is properly handled, it offers the best uh, prospect for providing objective and reliable information on incidences which are under investigation. So we cannot actually uh, overemphasize uh, the importance of uh, proper, proper sample collections, proper preservation, proper handling, and uh, proper of comparing of the same evidence uh, to be part of the evidence before a court of law. Next slide. Therefore, uh, it is very important to understand that quality is of importance when it comes to the way we handle the, the, the scenes of crime and the way we handle what we are collecting, the way we package it, the way we label the scene, the way we transport it, they become very, very important aspects. And therefore, we can also not to ever overemphasize the important need of quality control measures and quality con control systems uh, so that we can be able to get uh, the evidence, uh, the primary evidence in the best, uh, the best state and get the correct uh, evidence so that this can be able to sustain uh, proper evidence presentation before a court of law. Therefore, we need to protect the evidence that is collected from a scene of crime where a scene of crime can even be a person. You know, a victim of rape is a scene of crime. A scene of crime can be a house can be a motor vehicle, it can be an open field. We need to, 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 to be able to know that uh, we need to protect 
uh, these items that are, we are calling evidential material from the two twin problems. One of the problems is uh, deterioration uh, because biological evidence undergoes deterioration very fast and cross-contamination. We need that evidence to be uh, in a very good state and we also need that evidence to be from a single source because during the process of carrying out collection and packaging and all that, we could introduce exogenous DNA, which was not part of the primary evidence that was corrected from a scene of crime. Next slide, please. Yeah. So that it becomes very important to know that uh, we, we need to be able to properly process the evidence that we correct from a scene and to be able to package it in the right way. And therefore, the other very important aspect of that process is the, uh, the process that we call the, or the, what, the aspect that we call the chain of custody. And this, in most cases, is the weakest link in uh, criminal uh, investigations. And this refers to the chronological and careful documentation of evidence uh, to establish its connectivity to an alleged crime. Therefore, we need to ensure that our chain of, cust chain of custody is able to demonstrate uh, both the traceability and the continuity of evidence from the crime scene to, to the court of law. In fact, the most important aspect of forensic uh, caseworks is proper maintenance of chain of custody. That uh, you could have very important evidence, but if we have a loose end in terms of the chain of custody, that evidence will not be admissible in any serious court of law. Next slide. Uh, therefore, we are saying that every incident, uh, be it a crime, an accident, a natural disaster, armed conflict, all these, they leave uh, traces of evidence. And this, uh, this trace evidence is both transient and very fragile. So we, the reliability and preservation of this physical evidence uh, to a large extent determines, uh, the, uh, is determined by the initial actions that uh, happen at the, at the scene of crime or the, the scene of the incident. And during my uh, oncoming uh, slides, I will be able to give like two or, two or three examples where a scene of crime was not handled very well and thereby the other consequence uh, analytical work that happened gave a lot of challenges because the scene of crime was not handled professionally, uh, the integrity of the samples was not properly maintained, the scene was not very secured, and therefore contamination uh, was, was, was allowed to set in. And uh, we will look into that as uh, we go downstream into the other right. So it calls for acting with a lot of care from all the players and a lot of professionalism throughout the uh, processing of the crime scene, all the way to presentation of the exhibits or the evidential material in the, in the laboratory, all the way to uh, adducing the evidence before court. Next slide. Now we are seeing um, a scene that is not properly uh, secured and preserved will lead to unnecessary activity. And I've just mentioned that, which is uh, may irreversibly modify, contaminate or compromise the scene and the evidence. And we have I've accurately stated that sometimes the evidence is traced. It is minute amounts of the evidence. And if we destroy that evidence, then it, it becomes very difficult to recreate the activities of the scene and to re also recreate the evidence. For example, if we are talking of a victim of uh, a survivor of, of rape, and then and a very important evidence like uh, the vaginal swab is probably interfered with or it's, it's allowed to deteriorate or get cross contaminated, then we have, we have destroyed a very important part of the evidence which you cannot recreate. So it becomes very important to uh, be able to secure that evidence, take uh, the utmost uh, care and also being able to act prof professionally. Uh, and that calls for whenever we are handling a scene of crime or whenever we are collecting or processing uh, a, a scene of crime, then we need to be in the right uh, protective gear so that 
ourselves, we will not introduce other evidences that were not part of the primary evidence, or we are also, again, ensuring that we have the safety uh, of the staff or the people that are involved in the processing the scene. Therefore, it becomes very important to understand that scenes of crime needs to be prof uh, processed with uttermost uh, professionalism. Next slide. Now, the search for evidential material in a, in a scene of crime uh, requires that we become very systematic, that uh, we must be very careful and very, very uh, critical with the issue of documentation, that there must be a systematic way where we, we handle the records uh, of all the materials. We take an inventory of all the materials that are present in a, in a crime scene and uh, we document the same uh, and documentation aims at producing a permanent and an objective record of the scene and uh, particularly of the physical evidence and any other changes that, uh, that take place. So accurate documentation is the starting point of the chain of custody. And once physical evidence is recognized, detailed documentation is made before it is removed or even recovered. So the whole aspect of mapping the scene the whole aspect of videography and taking photographs, uh, taking sketches, you know, documenting every single detail because we might not get opportunity to revisit the scene. And even if we do, the scene might not be virgin the way it was. So the very first responders to a scene of crime must ensure that the scene is properly processed, properly documented, and every detail is captured because that might be critical uh, in, in the downstream processes and the other people that you come into contact with that evidence being processed. Uh, let's go ahead with the next slide. And thereby, so every uh, uh, particular item of importance in a scene of crime must uh, be identified and the people who are processing the scene must understand uh, what kind of evidence they need to collect and how they need to package that evidence and how they need to, to label that evidence. And it's important to ensure that uh, the, at the earliest opportunity, we need to take this evidence to the lab as fast as possible because of that dual nature of, uh, of, of, of the evidence that it is fragile and it is, it is vulnerable to deterioration. Biological evidence, they the, the deteriorate very fast and they are, thereby we need to process it very quickly so that we can take it to, to the lab. And each piece of evidence uh, should be labeled and sealed following laid down requirements and, and uh, regulations. So priorities in evidence also must be given uh, to avoid unnecessary errors and degradation. So extremely degradable evidential material should be uh, processed as quickly as possible and transmitted to, to the laboratory. Next slide. Of course, I will not overemphasize that the need for the people processing evidential material uh, to ensure that uh, they do not pose a risk to the people downstream, that is probably the scientist or the analyst that will be working on that, the people to receive the same, and even themselves. That calls for people to be in the right, the right gear, and especially when it comes to handling of DNA evidential material. It is of uttermost uh, importance to ensure that any item that is handled, it is uh, with the, the person that is doing it is handling that, that with gloves uh, because of the, that very important aspect of cross, uh, cross contamination. DNA can be amplified on very minute amounts. Therefore, handling of DNA material with your, with your own uh, with, uh, with, your, with your own hands without gloves. And it, it, is, it, is, of, it, it is of very great importance to, en to ensure that you always be on gloves, you always be on the right gear, because you can introduce DNA into the items that you want to be, to be analyzed. And of course, some of the other materials that uh, are being handled can also be hazardous, they can be toxic, uh, they, can be, they can be risky. Therefore, every aspect of health and safety should be ensured. Next slide, please. Now, the DNA laboratory workflow is a whole lengthy process that, of course, begins with uh, receiving materials that 
are needed to be analyzed in the lab. And those materials uh, come with the proper documents. And of course, we expect that uh, if it is not for a civil case, for criminal cases, that uh, the items to be analyzed will, sub will be submitted by a police officer who will identify themselves. And they also have, must have the proper documentation yeah, and the proper legal instruments like uh, the police exhibit memo form that will be properly filled and the inventory of each of the evidential material will be properly recorded and taken account into uh, within that document so that the, the person receiving the same at the laboratory will be able to cross check and ensure that whatever is being submitted is also the same that has been properly or ably uh, pronounced within the legal document that is the police exhibit memo form. Now, once they have been received, then the DNA processing will start uh, by first of all opening an examination of those items. We will redocument the same by photography, by sketches, by taking descriptions that every item will have to be described. And that is the, the, the why it is very important to be able to do the proper packaging and also to be able to do the proper labeling because whatever is labeled must marry with what is within the packaging so that we don't have a, a scenario where um, uh, the packaging is talking of a, a blue underpant and inside we are having a red shirt. So, you know, they should agree. Every item should agree with the labeling uh, that is written very clearly on the packaging and on the other documents that are used to, to submit the items. Now, the workflow for the DNA processing involves, first of all, the DNA extraction. DX, DNA extraction involve, involves rupturing the cell membrane and the nuclear membrane and throwing the same into the solution and then separating the, the DNA by uh, centrifugal forces because DNA is more denser so that you can accurately be able to work on free DNA. Once you are able to do that, you have extracted your DNA, you have separated it from the other cellular contents, and you have been able to separate it from the, 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 the binding proteins, that DNA now is free for processing. You now can uh, be able to quantify how much of that DNA you have, you have, you have extracted. Because the amplification process requires that there is an, an optimum concentration within which that DNA is amplifiable. Too little, no amplification. Too much, then you have a lot of problems when it comes to the issue of detection. Then you come to the other process, which we call DNA amplification, and uh, it's a whole workflow in itself, where you use a thermocycler, the DNA that you extracted is your template. You have other, what we call the nucleotide substrates that you are using to uh, amplify that DNA, and you have an enzyme, which we call the DNA polymerase, that, is, that catalyzes that process of, uh, is actually a polymerization. Now, the DNA amplification process I would like to simplify and break it down into just like what we do in the simple photocopying, that you have one copy of a page that you make many copies of from one single copy. So from one single template of DNA, you can amplify areas of interest to millions of copies that uh, are detectable. You're amplifying to, to bring that DNA to detectable levels. Now, the DNA detection is uh, the other part of the workflow. That is where you have specific equipment, the DNA uh, genetic analyzers that are able to uh, detect the DNA that you amplify through what we call capillary electrophoresis. And you are able now to generate what we call the raw data, which will now be translated by softwares into individual DNA profiles, what we call the unique uh, DNA identifiers. So that uh, DNA that has been detected um, as I said, it, 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 the, the end result is a DNA profile, which you now have to process that data by data evaluation, by interpretation, and by now looking at the implication of what you have been able to process, and then you can be able to, to write a, pro, a, a report. Next slide, please. So this is an example of a DNA profile. I will not uh, go into the specifics, but uh, if you look at uh, each of the regions which are differently uh, dye labeled, you can be able to appreciate that uh, we have about 16 uh, DNA loci and uh, those particular 
uh, loci are in different chromosomes, and there are, there are 16 of them which are uh, selectively selected by the forensic community to be able to generate individual DNA profiles, and that is how it looks like. So I will not go into the very details. If I had time, I would uh, look at each specific one, but I would like you to appreciate that in each of these loci, you have two peaks, but you also have seen in some situations you have a peak, uh, one singular peak, but uh, those are accurate two peaks which are superimposed on one, uh, one another. So what we are saying is that those are like alternate, those we call them areals, those are alternate genes, uh, because we know uh, chromosomes uh, occur naturally uh, as homologous chromosomes, that is in pairs, so it is an areal in each of the homologous chromosomes. Kindly, let's go to the other slide. Uh, I don't want to go to the complexity of uh, trying to, to understand that. Let's go to the applications of the DNA technology. Go to the next slide. One of the, no, go to the next one. The next, next, yes. The other next one. Yeah, one of the very robust, one of the, sorry, sorry, the previous one, kindly. Go to the previous slide, thank you. Yes, one of the most, uh, oh, sorry, no, 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 go to the next one. I want to see that one of the paternity, maternity. Thank you. Yeah, one of the most uh, uh, ways, oh my, <laughs> one of the biggest ways where DNA technology is being used in the world today. Wow, 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 wow. Let's get back to the one of paternity, please. Previous, previous. The other one, previous one. Thank you. Now, we, one of the biggest ways where DNA technology is being applied today in the forensic quark is what we call genetic relationships, determination of genetic relationships among them is paternity testing, paternity stroke maternity testing. The other one is kinships, and the other one is uh, ancestral relationships. And there are very many matrices that are being used in that, but uh, I would like you simply to appreciate that it is the DNA technology that you'll be used to uh, determine whether uh, parentage, parentage is where we make a determination on the parents of a child, like we have been having several cases where families are tussling over a single child or a child, uh, two families, and thereby we are able to make a determination using DNA on the issue of uh, parentage. We are also able to do paternity testing where we want to establish who is the biological father of a, of a child. I would like you to appreciate, number one, that each person is a contribution of uh, a biological mother and a biological father. And each of them contributes 50%, about 50% of the, of the DNA content of the offspring. That is, uh, a sperm cell has 23 chromosomes, an ovum has 23 chromosomes. During the process of uh, fertilization and by formation of the zygote, the 23, 23 come together to form the 46. That is actually, in essence, we are saying this child is half the father and half the mother. By looking at the, the child's DNA profile, you will be able to appreciate the parts that has come from the biological mother and the parts which have come from the biological, I mean the areals that have come from the biological mother and the biological father. And you'll be able actually to exclude an individual just on account of uh, being excluded from only two law signs. When somebody is excluded from two law signs, that person can never be the biological father. Now, let's go to the other slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. DNA is also very much in application in the issues of uh, criminal justice, where uh, we make determinations on issues based on uh, sexual and gender-based uh, violence. That is the issues of defilement, the issues of rape. And uh, of particular importance is that um, Lock the Lockhart principle, Edmund Lockhart said every contact leaves a trace. Therefore, when a crime has been committed, it is important to understand 
that there are uh, evidences that you'll be left either at the services or with the people that were involved. So during the process uh, of an assault, like uh, that of the sexual assault, uh, you'd expect that uh, if uh, there was, for example, ejaculation, you, you expect the services or the, uh, the clothing or the people themselves might contain part of the biological evidential material. So one of the most key important uh, evidence that comes from a sexual-based violence case is uh, trying to determine whether there is presence of spermatozoa and the second thing, the issue of the epithelial cells. Nowadays, we can even go further, try and look at, was there evidence of contact DNA? Uh, and and I, I did actually mention that sometimes the contact DNA, we can be able to get it from doorknobs, from mobile phones, from cigarette butts, you know, just the minute amounts of DNA left by just mere contact. Now, uh, the most important uh, evidential materials that are very critical for a sexual offense. One of them is the intimate sample from the victim. And that is the vagina, the high vagina swab. It is very important uh, that we are able to, to take a vagina swab, which basically we should be able to, to, to do that within the next, uh, within the 72 hours after that has happened. That doesn't mean that if a victim presents himself after 72 hours, we don't go ahead and take a, a HVS, we should, uh, because we should uh, make attempts of try and see whether we can be able to get any uh, biological evidential material from that. So IHVS is very important. We also should be able to take the reference samples from both the victim and the assailant. Uh, basically nowadays we take the buccal swabs, it's non-invasive um, and uh, it's also less hazardous. Uh, apart from the onset of COVID, it was very safe. Um, the other um, items are the inner clothing, uh, things like the underpant, things like the petticoat, you know, all those things are very important. If a condom was used, it is of utmost importance to have that condom because it can be able to tell us two things. In the inside of the condom, we can be able to, uh, to, 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 to get, uh, if a condom was used, we can be able to get uh, the, the DNA from the one who won it for contact DNA and outside it, we can get a mixed profile uh, from both the victim and the, and the assailant. So those are very critical. When we get that, we of course process it through documentation and uh, then we go to the other downstream processes. Uh, let's go to the other slide, please. I'm trying to be as fast as possible. Um, so some of the presumptive tests that we subject uh, evidential material for sexual offenses is uh, one of them is a Ceratec P30 uh, based on the prostate specific antigen that is able to tell us whether there is that, uh, that glycoprotein within which is an indicator possibly there was amino material. And the other one is what we call the aptest test um, that we also try to see whether there is any evidence. These are presumptives on whether it's any evidence of uh, amino material. But of course, as I said, these are the preliminary tests. We need to subject now these tests to more confirmatory tests. Next slide. Uh, so we, we, we need to carry out, uh, my, we need to process the seminal stain for microscopy, thereby so that you can be able to appreciate that you, you have seen the, under microscopy, you have seen the spermatozoa, whether full spermatozoa or degenerated, you can be able to see that and you also, be able to see the, the epithelial cells. So microscopy is one of the confirmatory methods that we use to confirm that indeed uh, we are working with a seminal stain because we can be able to see uh, spermatozoa. Uh, next slide, please. Then um, other confirmatory methods that we use to be able to confirm that indeed uh, we have seminal stains is that we carry out, once we have been able to do the presumptives on the P30, uh, what we call the, 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 the prostate specific antigen test and the aptest test, then microscopy, then we subject that to what we call differential, differential extraction. Differential extraction is where you separate within the seminal fraction or the seminal stain, you separate both the male fraction and the female fraction so that you can differentiate it uh, being able to process each of them, you can be able to individualize the male fraction 
to get the DNA profile uh, that will be generated from that fraction. And then you can also be able to uh, generate a DNA profile from the female fraction. And the, it will give you two things. The male will tell you who was the assailant. The female uh, fraction will be able to give you the DNA of the victim. Now, today we also have a, another advanced uh, platform that we are using, which we are calling the Y chromosome DNA. The, the Y chromosome DNA, the y -chromosome DNA uh, literally, because sometimes uh, there, are, there, are, there are two problems happen. Because number one, you could have a situation whereby the, the, the person is aspermic, you know, or, or azospermic. And uh, trying to get a good DNA from that will be a problem. But you can also be able to get the male epithelial cells to give you a Y chromosome DNA profile, which will also direct and lead you to the assailant. That is very important. The other thing that happens, the other challenge that we have is that within the, the vaginal swabs, the, the female fraction little mops and camouflages the entirety of the female of the male fraction. You, you understand that uh, it is a, is, a, is a very hostile environment for the, for the spermatozoa. Therefore, the lifespan of the spermatozoa within the, 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 the vaginal cavity may not be that prolonged because of the brutality of the, the fruits. Thereby, we, we, we are saying after many days, you might not be able to get uh, the spermatozoa, but you can be able to process that and see whether you, there are possibilities of getting a full Y DNA profile, which can also be able to lead you to a possible assailant. Next slide. Then we also use the DNA technology beside the genetic relationships and the sexual assaults. We also able to do that on homicide cases, cases where somebody has been, has been killed. And um, as you can see from that slide, you, you have different scenarios where somebody has been killed. You can be able to see that there's a lot of uh, blood, uh, blood smears and blood spills, and that can be able to, to tell us a lot of stories. We can be able to generate DNA. And uh, from the items that are left, we can also be able to get a lot of information. If the people who are doing these, uh, these, these uh, while, while drinking water bottles, we can be able to get DNA from uh, used water bottles. We can get DNA from chewing gum, we can get DNA from uh, toothpicks, get DNA from cigarette butts. There's a whole assort assortment of items that we can work on that can also be able to, uh, together with the reference samples, we can be able to match and see uh, who was uh, present at the, at the scene. And in actual fact, is this, is this place where uh, the person was killed? Because sometimes you get somebody has been killed in another place and transported to another secondary scene of crime. We have the primary where the person was killed and a secondary place where the somebody was transported. Through the DNA technology, we can be able to connect all that. Next slide, please. Um, and we also process the same. We have varieties of tests that we do. We have what we call the Casomea test that is testing for the presence of blood. We have what we call him direct, confirming whether that blood is human. And then we also document, we open the items, we document, and then we examine and we analyze. The whole protocol for analyzation or analysis involves the extraction, the quantitation, the amplification, and the detection and all that data evaluation and interpretation. Let's go ahead with the next slide. Now, other applications of DNA that are not ordinarily done on uh, every day is, uh, well, the DNA on missing persons investigations. We all can remember the Naivasha Karai, the Moi Girls fire, the Gekomba fire. We all can remember all these cases, including Ducit, including uh, the, the Westgate and the Galiza uh, terrorist activities. Uh, tracing and get, be able to get missing persons is one of uh, the other ways that we use the DNA technology. The other one is the military DNA dog tag. This especially happens in the, the military. Uh, the US, the UK, and, and some of these first world countries are able to do that, that you are able to profile all your combatants, all the soldiers that will be going for war, you take their DNA so that in case they get killed and buried in mass graves, that you can be able to uh, be able to compare the DNA against their DNA. That is what we call the military dog tag. 
We also, there is also a lot of application of uh, DNA in cold cases where they are reviving cases which were done by other previous methods like uh, the protein pol pol polymorphism and the blood grouping methods. They are now trying to, to look at that using the DNA technology. And there are so many people that have been uh, exonerated that were previously convicted. Next slide. I don't know whether I have still time. The moderator can tell me whether I still have time. So uh, you, you can be able to see that is a, sorry for the, is a very graphic, uh, graphic uh, photo that I've put there. I'm sorry for that. But uh, I would like to say that uh, in, in, you, if you can look at this photograph, there is no way possible to be able to identify those people using physical means. You know, I don't expect those people maybe to have fingerprints you cannot be able to look at the, uh, the, physical, the facial expressions and be able to identify these people. The only applicable tool will be the DNA technology to do that kind of an identification. So DNA is very much applicable in such a scenario. Go ahead with the next slide. Yeah, we have our own Naivasha Karai disaster, which happened in, uh, I think the year 2000 and, uh, is it 17? Uh, 17 or 18, I can't remember the year very well, but uh, we, 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 processed, uh, we processed those, uh, those remains. And I'll tell you in a minute, I'll, if you go, go to the next slide, I'll be able to tell you that uh, this, go ahead, go ahead with the next uh, slide. Now, I would like to very quickly be able to tell you that in this particular incident, there are so many vehicles that were involved. The vehicles were banned completely. The occupants were charged, were charged beyond any physical identification. And what, what is of importance here is that this scene was not properly secured. Remember, I really men, uh, mentioned that the scenes should be professionally processed. Now, what happened in this particular incident is that uh, uh, the issue of clearing traffic became more of a priority than preservation and processing the scene as a forensic scene. Thereby, the, 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 the police officer who went there quickly said, you clear all the vehicles from the road and get the remains from there to take them to the mortuary. So bodies were just removed in hurry. And they were, they were packed in various body bags. So we had a lot of commingled remains. You know, you would have uh, two or three heads in one, one bag. You'd have several eggs and several whatever. You know, all these, the, 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 the remains were commingled. So it became a lot of work for us to be able to process, uh, to process that. And also the issues of cross-contamination became uh, quite a, a huge reality. Let, let's go ahead. Uh, I'm trying to be as quick as possible. Uh, go ahead. It is the same scene. You can see that people, go ahead. The people are allowed to, to come in and mingle in the howling. So the, the remains were not properly uh, preserved in situ. Uh, many bodies were dismembered during recovery. They would pull out the bodies without any consideration. There was a lot of risk of contamination, laborious and expensive identification, and uh, remains were exposed to uh, agents of degradation. In fact, I would have you know that even many weeks after, some remains were still being found at the scene, you know, which, which was really very, very unfortunate. So the scene was not properly ma uh, managed. Next slide. Yeah, uh, ne next slide. Uh, so people did not have a proper P PPE apart from a few. Most of the other people are just touching what they could and uh, everything was messed up. Next slide. Uh, so after the recovery, we needed to do uh, postmortems and the bodies were transported to Chiroma Mochari only a few could be identified to, with, with, the, uh, with the fingerprint. So a decision was uh, made that all remains to be subjected to DNA, DNA human identification. Next slide. So uh, the, po sorry, uh, the, the post-mortem was properly coordinated. We had uh, multiple uh, agency teams and everything worked uh, very well seamlessly. And uh, we were able to, to do that uh, very well. Each 
well, this is very important. During the DNA sampling for, for such an event, is, it is very critical to know that uh, a set of sterilized tools, tools are to be used per body. Each team handling should handle a body at a time, ensuring a new set of tools and gloves as you bring in on another body that you are able to change the gloves and change the tools. Uh, body blood swabs are taken from deep uh, muscle cuts, uh, more specifically the one on the thigh muscle. Uh, finger and toenails, if available, are also very important. The coastal cartridges from the sternum area are also very important uh, because those are the areas where DNA better preserves. You know, the fingernails, the deep muscles, and uh, of more particular interest is the, the long bones, like the femur, the femur and the shaft. And uh, if you have several moras, those are very important. Those are, the, those are actually some of the key, uh, the key samples that you can take from child remains, and you still can be able to get proper and good DNA for, for, the, for the work. Packaging and, uh, and, and labeling should be consistent, that should be ensured. Then let's go to the next slide. Uh, we can try to jump a few so that I can finish. Uh, so the reference samples, uh, if I can just put on this, eh? uh, in terms of where we are looking at identification of missing persons or unidentified bodies, the order of priority of the reference samples would begin with the biological parents. If the biological parents are there, it is important to have them. And we have never said, I've heard this on media that we, we say we don't want fathers. That has never come out from us. We have never said we don't want fathers. It is both the parents, if they are available. Biological children in that order, biological siblings, uh, paternal males uh, for use of the Y chromosome DNA, and maternal males where we have the ability to do mitochondrial DNA. Next slide, please. Uh, let's jump on the one for the Moi girls. This was a learning point from uh, Naivasha Karai. The right things were done. We were able to quickly process and identify all the bodies within about three days because we had learned the good lessons from the Naivasha Karai. Uh, let's go ahead. Mm. So the overall challenges in such kind of uh, scenarios is one is the issue of the deterioration of remains, environmental factors. We need to also to ensure that we have a, a singular command and lead agency at the scene so that we don't have things going out of hand Information and accuracy of the same should be ensured. We are also dealing with issues of emotive relatives that uh, we should be very patient with them and we should be able to give them the right information. And then the remains should never be processed, should never be preserved with formalin before we have taken DNA samples. Formalin is an inhibitor to DNA processing. So I think that is very important for me to mention that that uh, if, uh, if remains are to be processed for DNA, kindly do not embalm. Wait for the DNA samples to be, say, to be taken, because if you do embalm using formalin, then you, you, you have destroyed the DNA evidence that we want to, to do that. Then uh, the issues of cross-contamination should be, uh, you never use a tool on two, on two bodies and uh, never put a body on a surface where you had placed another body without first sterilizing and decontaminating. And then the whole issue of resource mobilization to ensure that you have all the tools and all the PPEs that you need. Next slide. I uh, hope to be coming to the end uh, of my talk. Uh, I may not have time to talk about the forensic DNA database. Uh, this is something that we need to establish in our country where we can be able to store all our DNA profiles. And those are some of the milestone cases that we have handled. I don't need to go through them. And I think uh, with that, I can come to the end of my talk. Uh, and thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Joseph. And Can sorry for talk? taking too much time. It's OK, we understand. But the topic was really necessary. So as we wait for Dr. Rom to share his screen, we'll stop sharing on our end. And as we wait for him, uh, there are a few comments that I've seen. And one is a question, are our traffic police and first responders routinely trained and retrained on evidence, scene preservation, and how to control bystander interference. That's one of the things, and it's one of the challenges that you mentioned. So are our first responders and traffic police trained in that, Dr. Kimani? 
Uh, no, um, we, we have tried to look into that, especially coming as an offshoot from uh, the Naivasha Karai issue. And uh, basically it has been repeated in some other incidences. But uh, we are working, we, we came up with what we call a national, uh, a national technical team, uh, which composes of the DCI, ourselves, the pathologist, and a few other agencies. And uh, we, we came up almost with some bare minimums and uh, part of that is disseminating information to the other police officers to be able to understand what they need to do and what they do not need to do. And we also took a point of uh, going to Kiganjo. Uh, myself and a few of, uh, other of our senior officials, we visited Kiganjo and we are trying to work together with them in uh, uh, bettering their curriculum. So some of these issues uh, should not be repeated. We, we, are, we are doing something about it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Olong, you could be uploading your, or sharing your screen. All right. We would like to, we'd also like to welcome Dr. Jen Mnyapara. So Dr. Olong, you go first and then Dr. Jen Mnyapara will take us through the next session. Yeah, so as Dr. Olong shares the screen, um, there's a comment. Somebody saying very good presentation. However, I have a concern because the part about DNA confirmation in rope cases, you have assumed that in all those cases, the assailant is male and the victim is female. Please revise that. Thank you for that feedback. We will revise that. Uh, there's another question for Dr. Kimani. And some, somebody is asking, what is really the problem to some families' DNA? Because you might find that in a certain family, when the children attain a certain age, let's take 12 years, they become blind or they come from, okay, that's not a question related to forensic. Uh, Jonathan, uh, unfortunately, sorry, that's not a question related to forensic. Uh, Dr. Kemani, somebody is asking, does formalin destroy only human DNA? Okay, we seem to have lost to Dr. Kim. Uh, he seems to have dropped off. So Sorry, we have Dr. I, had, I had muted my, my microphone. Okay. Okay, okay. So you, you have asked whether formalin destroyed all types of DNAs? Yes, somebody is asking whether it destroys only human DNA. No, it, it destroys uh, any DNA mm. for the reason that uh, it uh, inhibits the process of DNA amplification. It is at the point of DNA amplification that DNA, that formalin is, an, is a competitive inhibitor. Okay. All right, thank you. And uh, the few questions about DNA testing, I don't know whether you'll be able to type your answer to, somebody is asking about the cost and how long it takes, and another one is mm -hmm. asking about false positives, so, so that you can proceed to Dr. Long's uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. Maybe those two questions you could have a conversation or just type your answer about the cost. Yeah, I'll, I'll be DNA. looking at them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you once more again, Dr. Kimani. If there are any other questions, we will let you know. Welcome. Okay. Uh, Dr. Along. Right. Thank you very much. First, I apologize. Uh, I'm working from home, so you can be here. You'll hear some uh, children in the background. And if you do, please forgive me. They're my children and of course my neighbor's children and uh, but other is uh, Rod I hope you're hearing me well yes we can hear you well and it is okay the children are not too loud so just go ahead awesome thank you very much for the Hello, Dr. Alon. Cause of death at the University of Nairobi. And uh, um, my main practice is on uh, autopsy pathology. So I'm going to look at uh, clinical care. Basically, what is the autopsy and what is its use in clinical care? We'll also look at the medical legal and clinical autopsy work and various scenarios where the autopsy, uh, how we apply autopsy in clinical care, and a bit about the death investigation where there is no pathologist. 
So most uh, deaths occurring in clinical care are like, uh, due to the, the actual disease process as part of its natural history of uh, disease. We can also see undiagnosed disease occurring um, and, and they have been undetected. I mentioned current disease. I usually do a lot of maternal mortality work. That's why I have lots of references to pregnancy. But this is true in every disease process. We have uh, deaths occurring due to misadventures, difficult procedures, crew accidents, failure of equipment, various misadventures where there is an intentional injury or retention of uh, instruments. And a lot of them are definitely due to the environment. So of course, uh, whenever these deaths occur, we perform medical legal autopsies. The autopsies we perform are defined by the National Coroner Service uh, Act uh, number 17 of 2018. It's not yet in full application, but at Kenyatta National Hospital, we apply the provisions of this act to the best of our ability. We always look for good clinical documentation. Of course, uh, even though it's a forensic or medical legal process, we still engage the next of kin and get some uh, degree of assent. We usually go through records, but this is not my area. I do not look for falsification, but these ones are easily identifiable. And uh, one of the main uh, um, parts of advice I give my clinical colleagues is that whenever there is a mortality, we prefer that you leave everything in place so that we can examine it um, appropriately. So we usually, because we are a clinical, a teaching hospital, we want to involve the clinical team as much as possible. And we like their presence or their representation. And our autopsies will always be complete. And I'll show you why. The dissection procedures we modify to spare uh, medical um, areas or, or what, what do I call it, surgical incisions and so on. And the various documentations that we do of course, has to be comprehensive. Uh, Dr. Mungai Kimani story has shown us uh, pictures of uh, where photography has come in, and we have to apply everything as we can. Our conclusions and descriptions are unambiguous, and we always want to have clear conclusions. There are circumstances where this is not possible, but in many scenarios, we can come up with clear conclusions. And the beauty of that is that it will resolve intellectual tension and we can discuss and unearth sensitive issues, especially in the mortality meeting. Sometimes when you have difficulties, we may involve independent clinicians within the affected specialty and, in, and the clinicians. And of course, not only clinicians, but the nursing staff are critical in this area. And then we come up with a final cause of death. And I will not go into this in a lot of detail today where we use the, what we call the decode process aligned to the ICD-10 system. So just to uh, show you how we assign cause of death, we list down all diagnoses, all diseases that we detect. We identify whether this disease process has the shortest duration to death or the shortest antemortem interval. And the one with the shortest is the one we assign as the immediate cause of death. And then we look at the relationship between that disease and the rest and identify whether there is a causal factor or causal chain. Okay, so we do the causality. And that is what we do. And all diseases that we mention have to, we have to use terminologies that are defined by the ICD-10. Here was ICD-11. Then eventually, once we have a cause of death, we also assign a manner of death or we suggest a man of death. National Corona Service Act said, um, states that the manner of death is assigned by the pathologist who's acting as a coroner at that uh, particular scenario. And with that, we can assign manners of death as homicide, accidental, suicide, or medical misadventure, which is a special accidental category relating to deaths in healthcare. And if we do not know, we just say we don't know. And when we say we don't know, it means that this case has to go for an inquest. Right, so the National Corona Service Act defines the deaths that we need to examine under the act. And those are the ones we call forensic. And uh, uh, Dr. Takimani has mentioned some of them. 
So all forms of violence, any misadventure, and not only medical misadventure, but we mean misadventure in very yes, negligence, misconduct, and malpractice. Spe specifically, the Act wants us to also look at deaths due to pregnancy, deaths occurring in custody, and various things. And uh, the reason we are doing this is that uh, we need to come up with various, the main information is to identify the cause and manner of death. That's very important. The second is to identify issues that are useful in identifying the preventive measures that can be undertaken to prevent similar deaths. Okay. Right. So now I'm going to take you through some cases. I am assuming most of you are familiar with the healthcare environment. And if you're not, um, I want to apologize. Some of these cases will be extremely distressing to you, but I show them purely for an educational uh, uh, purposes. And, and uh, Rhoda, and, uh, sorry, Dr. Kalondo, if you find that I've gone too far with this, you please let me know. You can interrupt me, right? Yes, okay. I will. Okay. Thank you. So this is the first case uh, that I'll take you through. It's a maternal mortality, and this is the autopsy picture, and you can see that there's a surgical scar. But what we know is that this was a 38-year-old female with an who underwent a cesarean section. And after that, uh, she had hemorrhage and died prior to repeat surgery. What's known is that she's a diabetic and hypertensive. And internally, of course, we confirmed that she truly was pregnant. And uh, there was a bit of bleeding here. And one of these unusual things the pathologist performing the autopsy found was an adrenal tumor. Here's a picture is trying to show us that adrenal tumor, which we examined and found and diagnosed that it's a specific adrenal tumor that, 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 that affects the adrenal cortex and uh, it's a which is called a cortical adenoma definitely related to hypertension and diabetes so we at least we know why this lady has hypertension and diabetes now why did she bleed so this is a uterus when it's been dissected in two and you can see the single arrow shows where the surgeon had operated uh, through and the two arrows show the complication of that surgery, meaning that there is a posterior tear and rupture. And this identifies exactly why, why um, where he bled. Now, what do you think is the cause of death? Um, Dr. Kalondo, would you like to attempt this? <laughs> Sorry for putting you on the spot. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, I've seen that she had some bleeding. Yes. Uh, the mother also, sorry, uh, the mother also had uh, just delivered, although an IFD. Mm. Uh, you said the last slide, sorry, I didn't get, get exactly what you said on the last slide. It was an adrenal mass. That we an found. adrenal mass. She's diabetic, she's hypertensive. Uh, and I hope my, uh, the other participants are typing in what they think is the cause of death. You can type in what you think is the cause of death. You can hypothesize. The, the other participants, we open up the chat box for them to type in. Yeah, yeah. Let yeah, open up the chat box. You can even that. do it on the Q&A box and you can let okay. me know All right. what so they're thinking of. So as, as you're thinking of what uh, the cause of death is, what you can see from this is that the post, the autopsy, you know, the word autopsy simply means to see for yourself. And uh, what we are describing here is what we have seen. We are not uh, uh, coming up with things out of the blue, right? And that is the real essence of the, of the autopsy process. Of course, it has to be done following specific guidelines. And as uh, Dr. Kimani has mentioned, the body is viewed as a crime scene. The pathologist is the lead investigator in that crime scene and uh, has to be methodolic, met, methodical in the approach. Right, Dr. Kalondo, I'm interested in what uh, the audience is uh, thinking of. Have they mentioned something? Yes, in the chat box, uh, Joseph is saying uterine tear, uh, mm -hmm. Sylvia is saying hypertensive emergency, Mary is saying surgical mm -hmm. complication, Anthony is saying chromocytoma complicating PPH, 
Mm -hmm. uh, we do see saying hemorrhage from surgical posterior tear of the uterus. Brenda is saying wow. DIC, severe hemorrhage leading to shock and death. Angeline uh -huh. is saying hypovolemia. Lynette is saying postpartum hemorrhage due to uterine tear. Yes. Uh, Moses mm -hmm. is saying Waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome. And then Grace and Faith are saying PPH. Wow, okay. I think Moses has just been reading, has recently just been reading about adrenal pathology. And I really like what all of you have said. You've said that really um, pretty much uh, the essence, but this is how I will word it. So, cause of death are classified into two broad groups. The first group is the immediate cause of death, and uh, the cause of death is a disease process itself. And what we are able to demonstrate here, both from clinical and pathology, is that there is postpartum hemorrhage. And we all agree on that, right? And the next diagnosis we can ex agree on here is that the lady had undergone a surgical procedure, which is a diagnosis on its own, right? So I've, diag I've mentioned the surgical procedure. The reason for the surgical procedure and the main complication of the surgical procedure, and I have linked the postpartum hemorrhage and the surgical procedure with the term due to, meaning that there is a causal linkage. Postpartum hemorrhage followed by, is one that occurred in terms of the shortest duration before death. And the reason, the next, the, 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 the surgery occurs at a longer duration compared to the postpartum hemorrhage, right? And that is how we've come up with the causal pathway. And of course, logically, we had identified the causal pathway. All the other diagnoses that were found are contributory. Okay, of course, they're important. So the immediate cause is very important because it describes what was happening around the time of death, right? These other causes give us information about the overall context in which this patient was being managed and uh, uh, gives us an idea of what sort of environment this patient would have been. So a lot of you, are, of course you're right, but what I, what I want you to take from this is that we have classified the causes of death into two. Those are the immediate and contributory causes, okay? And of course, they contribute. they're all important, but the most important is the immediate cause of death. Now, the next thing we'll discuss is the manner of death. So once we've assigned a cause of death like this, then we need to assign a manner of death. So manner of death, as I mentioned earlier, are the circumstances surrounding the cause of death. And so what circumstances are we seeing here? We classify manner of death into two broad categories. It's either natural or unnatural. Natural diseases are diseases that are intrinsic to the individual. Usually there is a genetic or genetic environmental uh, sort of relationship leading to that disease. Unnatural is are diseases that are external to the individual. So I'd like you to also go to the chat box and maybe for, I'll give you five seconds. In five seconds, what do you think is a manner of death? And Rhoda, what, what are you thinking? I know Rhoda, you're also thinking about something here. I am. <laughs> I'm yes, trying to multitask between two events happening at the same time, but it's okay. You're uh, amazing. I, I apologize for my lack of concentration. Uh, in no, no, no. You, you can handle it. You can handle yes. it. We know you. Now, let me read for, for you what uh, most of the participants are saying. They're saying it's a natural death. That's like five or is it six participants that you're having? They're saying it's a natural. The Joseph is saying medical misadventure. Yes. Hmm. So, Dr. Kimani, I'm curious about your, your opinion. So, sorry, I'm trying to respond to some of the questions that, that are being raised. Eh? Yes. Uh, I'll, let me process it in the mind just in a minute. Okay. Let me make it easier. I will move to the next slide. And uh, of course, the manner of death is accidental. So it's unnatural. And if we subclassify, it's accidental. If we, of course, we know that this is a medical misadventure because we can really move towards that. And the reason for that is that it's an operative mortality and you can see it's a direct complication of that surgery. 
Well, some people are probably saying natural because she's diabetic and hypertensive and she had an intrauterine and fetal death. Well, those are important disease processes, but they're not the immediate causes of death, right? And the fact that they are not immediate, they, give, they, they are not, um, we will not use that to determine the manner of death. And the manner of death is very important because it is, used, it is uh, utilized to, we use the manner of death of, from the forensic system to determine what is the next step in the investigation or uh, you know, the medical legal consequences of this specific thing. And what do you think will be the medical legal consequences of an accidental manner of death? You can type that, we will come back to that. I have a second case. This is a complex medical case. So it's a maternal mortality of a 23-year-old female. Had a, again, had an intrauterine and fetal death at 24 weeks. Has recurrent anemia, goes to hospital. She's transfused. But eventually she was transfer, referred to KNH and a diagnosis of acute leukemia was made. And unfortunately she died. And this is the spleen. What are we seeing on the spleen? We are seeing lots of dark spots on this uh, fresh spleen. Dr. Kimani said, Photography is very important. We've taken photography, you know, it's as part of the evidence that you're presenting. We look at the uterus and you're seeing the widespread uh, hemorrhagic areas on the uterus. So she must have been continually bleeding from this side. And again, we may see a bit of a biofilm. Now, this is the histology. So we've taken tissues from, this is uh, tissue from the uterus. And what we are seeing are lots of necrotic areas. We are seeing hemorrhage, red blood cells, but we're also seeing large biofilms of bacteria. So there are lots of bacterial biofilms here. And when we examine the lung, we, one of the blood vessels here is blocked with by, these are the small blood vessels blocked by blood clots. And the blood clots are cellular, okay? And this is definitely the morphology of a disseminated intravascular coagulation and we see quite a bit of it in a lot of uh, tissues. And when we examine one of the blood vessels in a lot more detail, we can even see bacteria. And if you perform a gram stain, we will identify whether it's a gram positive or gram negative bacteria. And uh, this one, I was looking at the heart. Of course, it's not unusual for individuals to have some pigment in the perinuclear position to tell us that they had nutritional uh, issues as well. Again, the tongue, we are seeing that biofilm, very dark biofilm. And when we look at beneath the tongue, we are seeing uh, an attempt at inflammation. But if you look at the areas, what we are seeing is that there's a, there, there's a, a, this is a focus of extramedullary hemopoiesis. And when we examine also in, in, in uh, uh, when we examine it, we are seeing leukemic cells. And these are many of the myeloid series, okay? Oh, I wanted, to, to, I wanted you to attempt the cause of death on this one. So you can see there are many diagnoses, lots and lots of diagnoses. Again, uh, from the history is that uh, this lady was uh, newly diagnosed with HIV, was newly diagnosed with HIV disease. Roda, any, uh, Dr. Kalondo, sorry, any comments on, uh, on this case? Uh, okay, let me go there in the chat people say DIC sepsis and DIC mm -hmm. sepsis mm -hmm. uh, septicemia sepsis mm -hmm. I'd like mm -hmm. us to apologize to uh, people who might not understand the abbreviation I we apologize, I apologize. We write a lot of abbreviations today we really apologize mm -hmm. but I hope you'll be able to stay on course and understand so somebody else is talking about natural cause, septic shock, uh, pulmonary embolia and severe hemorrhage, sepsis, immediate cause of death, DIC secondary to acute leukemia, pulmonary embolism, sepsis. Yes, yes. so we have quite a lot of sepsis, uh, votes on sepsis and uh, DIC, mm -hmm. yes. I like the audience. You really have a very good audience. Now, this is how I, I classified all the diagnoses that I made. The immediate cause of death, and I totally agree with these sepsis, and I've demonstrated bacilli that are likely gram negative with the sites where those bacilli are coming from. And uh, we've seen the sites are mainly endometrial and uh, pharyngeal biofilms. There's an endometritis. And of course, uh, this is, uh, we know that she had an IUFD, 
that is the next diagnosis that's macerated. And all this is related to the acute myeloid leukemia, which is promyelocytic with systemic leukostasis. Okay, too many terms. Uh, somebody says that in, what's his name in parliament? He says, Kizungu Mingi. But what I'm saying here is that at least we've properly classified the immediate causes of death. She definitely had HIV AIDS, but HIV stage one, and also had protein energy malnutrition, meaning that she probably in hospital for a long time. Manner of death here should be straightforward. Some of you have already said that this is a natural death, right? But it's still important for us to perform this autopsy. And why is that? And again, I apologize for my background. So why is it that it's important for us to use an autopsy process to investigate a death like this? So I would like you to put that in the, in the chat box, in the queue, and, and, and we can discuss this as we go on. Last scenario that I'm going to present. Now, this one is a patient who underwent surgery. Okay. Was that, and, and uh, had a post. And, and we are talking about deaths occurring in individuals who've been operated on, okay, and then they die within six weeks. So we call that a perioperative mortality. So uh, this one I know is going to make a lot of you cry. So bring your tissues close. It also made me almost cry. Okay, fine, I did cry as well. Right. So this is a six-year-old child. Has had abdominal pains for a period of two weeks and was admitted because of an acute abdomen, and I went surgery, and you can see the surgical scars there. You can see the surgeon has put ileostomies, but she didn't improve. Instead, she, de she, she developed respiratory failure, okay, specifically acute respiratory distress syndrome, and later on succumbed in ICU. Oh, why am I not moving? All right. Internal examination, this is what we find, and you can see that there's florid peritonitis, there's even an abscess, which is mainly extracapsular. And when we, uh, and one, we, so, so this one, if an individual wasn't very keen, would have said, okay, what's the cause of death? This is peritonitis, but let's move on, we see something. So when we're doing the pelvic dissection, so this is actually the vagina, and this is the uterine cervix, so the uterus is here. We are seeing that there is uh, inflammation of the vagina and there is an exudate, uh, there is actually pus within the cervix itself. So definitely if you see pus in the cervix with inflammation of the vagina, then you immediately make a diagnosis of a pelvic inflammatory disease. So we wondered where it's from. And so when we were doing the genital examination, we started seeing some injuries there. And you can see that there is a laceration here at six o'clock within the um, posterior foot chest or within the valve and the additional other injuries which have not demonstrated. And of course, uh, in these individuals, this may have been an incontinent child. You can see there's fecal staining of, the, of this. So what is the cause of death? We did find that there were gram-negative diplococci that are morphologically consistent with Neisseria gonorrhea. So I would, um, with this information, I would have called it Neisseria gonorrhea sepsis and uh, def definitely due to pediatric sexual assault. And the surgery is important because of course, uh, it's an invasive procedure, it's an important diagnosis, but it's what? It's definitely a contributory, but not the main diagnosis that, that we put in the immediate cause. So I would like you to, to type in and what you think we should put in for the next five seconds type in, what do you think is the manner of death here? And maybe uh, uh, Rhoda, you can, uh, Dr. Kalondi, you can give us your opinion now. This is unnatural, it's not accidental. Mm -hmm. It's a very sad case. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I also to the... ask you, did the clinical history uh, pick up the sexual assault history? Absolutely not. So this is a patient admitted in one hospital, transferred to another hospital, uh, to KNH for, the, for specialty care. She dies and uh, there was no mention of, of, of this or pelvic examination findings. So the sexual assault was totally missed on clinical examination. Okay. So 
this one just so, shows that yeah Rod, go on dr Kaloni. in the chat we have a uh, lot of participants saying unnatural but we have one accidental and mm -hmm. somebody saying pediatric assaults yes mm -hmm. but a uh, majority of the participants have said it's unnatural cause of death mm -hmm. yeah. and the reason i present this case is just to show you that without a methodology Method, methodical approach to the autopsy. Even an experienced pathologist can miss some of these cases. And if we are not performing an examination, we will definitely miss um, a lot of, the lots of things we'll miss if you don't open, right? So opening and seeing what's inside and taking specimens for testing in the laboratory and getting the actual diagnosis using a pathology informed process is what uh, at, at, these are the actual standards in autopsy practice. Now, manner of death, I've seen most of you have mentioned a few things. And this one, I immediately ruled it as a homicide. And the justification for this is that there is pediatric sexual assault with PID and abdominal inflammatory disease and, uh, and, and peritonitis. So of course, this is a dis disseminated gonococcal. I've seen a few people have mentioned accidental, but if you can properly call it a homicide, then we move from the accidental category because accidental would mean if this was a surgical um, error leading to maybe this disease, we see a lot of peritonitis as surgical errors. Okay, so those ones we use the term accidental, but this is definitely not a surgical error. Natural, if uh, of course we can make that judgment if we did not find gonorrhea, maybe we found another infection, we didn't see evidence of sexual assault, then we would have said maybe this is. But we, of course, the pathologist will be asked, asking critical questions: What is causing this? What is the actual disease? So it just shows that we must always go in to, to the final level as, you know, we must diagnose this as well as we can. And Dr. Kimani, unfortunately, for some reason, we were unable to uh, bring a good specimen to Dr. Kimani's laboratory. So the sexual assault profile did not pick up the perpetrator. Maybe the additional reasons for that, Dr. Kimani may probably discuss further why we didn't pick up. Of course, she was in hospital for two weeks before she died and so on. Right, so what happens when there is no pathologist? Now I've put this clean screen deliberately blank and I would like to see your opinions. Um, at what level do you want to see a pathologist? Do you want to see a pathologist at county referral level, national level like us at KNH, or uh, do you think pathologists should also be all the way down to health center dispensary level in terms of clinical care and performing autopsies at that level. And then the next question is, um, how do you think in the absence of a pathologist, what do you think is happening? Because we all, if, if you're working in an area where there is no pathologist, what is going on? I'm really interested to see your opinions on that. Okay, so going through the chat. First of all, I think mm -hmm. pathology should be at all levels mm -hmm. up to the county level, way down if possible. And if we have sufficient numbers, it is a very crucial role. And in the absence of that, uh, what we used to do back then when I was at the county was the medical officer used to do the autopsies or to be part of that team. So the comment section, people are saying the Pathology should be at the county level, county due to availability of morgues. Pathology should be all the way if possible at all levels of care, rely on verbal autopsy. Okay, without the pathologist, the doctor becomes one. Uh, mm. Somebody saying level four hospital, pathologist at all levels should be in all morgues. Okay, pathologist should not be in, in morgues, but mm -hmm. Yeah, that is one of the working areas. <laughs> Maybe you can clarify like, that. <laughs> yeah, I like and, uh, that. I like that. Yeah. I Somebody love being says in uh, level mm. one to five. Somebody saying up to level three. Yes, lack of pathologies leads, leads to a miss of cause of death. Each county should have a pathologist. 
there's the most senior MO does the autopsy in the county hospital. And I think that's the practice at the moment. So maybe Dr. Along, you can take us through that as we give you five more minutes to wind up. Great. Of course, we know that uh, we don't have quality data of most deaths and we don't know who dies from what. And the question is um, from you and maybe you have seen it, maybe you haven't, but knowing who dies from what is very important. And without that, there are many things we cannot, we cannot plan for healthcare. We cannot um, provide justice. We are talking about justice here. We, even the basic thing, we, we cannot even guide the practice of medicine without this kind of information. So, so this kind of evidence is essential, okay? So basically, I'm not going to go into all this because if, um, I think there's a lot to, to discuss today, but I've mentioned cause of death is very important and identifying the cause of death and writing it down properly and you say, this is the cause, therefore the manner will be this. And we need all that information. For example, uh, the autopsy should give us that. If Dr. Kimani has run a profile and we have an answer, we, have to, we need to incorporate that into the cause of death because it makes things so easy to whoever is dealing with this downstream um, that the cause of death is clearly written and there is good information. So we have to incorporate any testing that goes on in a deceased person. So that pathologist should not just be there, but should also lead I'm not going to talk about medical certification, but I do see this a lot, and I must say I hate it. Uh, how many of you have written cardiorespiratory arrest as the cause of death? Be, be, it's okay, you can type something about it, and maybe you can tell us why you write cardiorespiratory arrest, because the problem with this is that it doesn't give us so much information, and I can see even criminal elements have a way of hiding behind this diagnosis. Eh? And I will not talk about this person, maybe he's, our, he's your friend. I'm not going to discuss much, I've talked about the autopsy. So we expect the physician to provide a cause of death opinion at the immediately someone dies. But if the physician is unclear about the cause of death, please don't try something you're not sure of. Let us see it for ourselves. And that is what the autopsy does. We prefer that a physician who's trained in doing autopsies should do it, but we've seen that sometimes we have to work with additional teams, and I'm not going to go into a lot of this. Very brief mention of verbal autopsy. So if you cannot find a good clinical cause of death, there's no pathologist to perform an autopsy and say, okay, people living with HIV are dying of this, then we have to use the verbal autopsy and it's more like taking a history and getting some data, but putting it in a computer system, which goes through them, puts them together and comes up through the analog algorithmic approach, identifies a broad diagnostic process. Of course, the verbal autopsy cannot tell us that this is gram negative sepsis or gonococcal sepsis. It will just give us broad things and tell us, okay, we think it's an acute cardiac event, a stroke, a sickle cell crisis, and so on or various broad categories such as this list shows. We'll say it's sepsis, but we don't know what sepsis it is. It can give us some information in maternal mortality, like anemia of pregnancy, ruptured uterus, and others, and, and so on. And of course, its use is purely epidemiologic. Please do not bring, do not use verbal autopsy for forensic purposes, but it's very important because it has um, it gives some information where there is no doctor, where there is no pathologist. Right, um, I'm gonna skip all this. So finally, I'll just say that, as you mentioned, we think that the autopsy service should be available at the lowest level of care, as long as their mortalities are at that site. All those mortalities should be examined. Easier said than done, because pathologists are needed. Again, I'll mention, not all pathologists can or should perform an autopsy. I know my pathologist colleagues in the audience today are not going to be too happy with me, but it's definitely, and Dr. Kimani will tell you, it's not the easiest area. You need someone who can, who's patient enough to get that, and of course has the right knowledge. Various processes, it has to be incorporated into multidisciplinary teams, and of course there has to be equipment invested into this. So. 
I will conclude by, by mentioning that the autopsy is essential in evidence-based healthcare. It's essential in medical legal services. It's essential for security. It's essential for safety. And it's essential for just having a civilized society. And of course, it's highly resource intensive and uh, you definitely need that pathologist on the ground. Although without a pathologist, the things we are thinking of. I will stop here, Rhoda, and uh, sorry, Dr. Kalondo, I keep calling you Rhoda because you're my dear colleague. But thank you very much for, for this and I apologize for taking so much time. It's okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much for the wonderful presentation. We apologize to those who might have been triggered by the images, but it is necessary. It is what goes into the day-to-day -day activities of a pathologist. So we appreciate Dr. Walong for that you came with a visual uh, representation. Sometimes when we just get the theory part, we don't get to see what exactly the conversation that goes on and the work that you do is all about, but now we truly appreciate once you come in with the photos, we're able to understand. Uh, Dr. Jen Nyapara, we'd like you to share your screen and let me read a comment for you, Dr. Walong. This is from Ali Nyaga and he's saying, thank you, Dr. Walong, well done. I was your mentor as a nurse more than 10 years ago at Aga Khan. Wow, that is good. So you're having a conversation with people who know you from very far, which <laughs> is good. And, uh, oh, just one more question. Somebody is saying, um, if a postmortem is refused by the family, is there a choice for post for autopsy by diagnostic imaging? Are we reached there as a country? Unfortunately, we haven't reached there as a country or even as a planet. Yes. The we we use imaging to guide us on what to test, mm -hmm. and what we prefer is that we want to have an open conversation with everyone so that. The, and, and then utilize good facilities so that the autopsy process does not hurt. The autopsy process hurts when the incisions are not properly made, the reconstruction is poorly done, and uh, of course, and, and it, it even hurts more if this uh, family does not get the report, okay, the, or justice is not served. So there's a lot of despondency when those happens. But if it's done well, professionally and everything is put back very well then I think in my opinion and even I've, I've worked with Muslim clients everybody appreciates they only are unhappy when we do it and and we don't go to the bottom of it and they're totally unhappy with that we have additional approaches to to improve that especially for the non-forensic cases we can use needle biopsies to get tissue because having that specimen is what guides, like uh, Dr. Kimani is here, uh, told us earlier on, without that specimen being submitted to the laboratory for testing, then we lose a lot and we still need to make that connection. So imaging, unfortunately, does not give us that connection. But of course, uh, we can debate this the whole day. And uh, yes. I know Dr. Kimani can also give us insights onto that. Right. Thank you for Thank the question. Very, I love it. Thank you very much, Dr. Walong, for finding time and coming to tell us more about autopsies and what we need to do right. Uh, so we agree, no more cardiopulmonary arrest. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, so Dr. Jen Nyapara is here next uh, to talk take us through professional indemnity, which is something that we need to understand as healthcare workers. And it's right now quite a, it's a requirement before, for some of the professionals in this group, before we renew our licenses or we get retained by our regulatory bodies, we must have professional indemnity. So Dr. Jemna Para and Julius Mwangi will take us through this session. Uh, Dr. Jen? Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much to the Kenyatta team. Uh, Doc uh, Kalondo, um, I think right now we'll switch gears. We have had a lot of work. Um, I mean, the previous sessions are more clinical, so we'll go back to, we'll now focus now on, uh, on the insurance sector and uh, more specifically health insurance. So kindly confirm if you can see my slide. Yes, and I can see your slides. Okay, fine. Thank you. So I'm joined today with uh, Julius. Uh, from the general business, so he'll take us through briefly on professional indemnity. 
So uh, I will start with, um, so my presentation will be more on uh, challenges with, sorry, yes, challenges uh, facing medical insurance and more specifically looking at uh, medical insurance claims. So in a nutshell, I'll just give you a brief overview of uh, the health insurance business. Uh, then the next uh, item I'll look at are the challenges. Then I'll also take you through some of the healthcare cost drivers. Uh, I'll also take you through fraud and abuse, one of the, uh, actually one of the main challenge that we experience uh, in the health insurance business. Uh, then I'll take you through again, uh, what are the policy terms and conditions. And basically for, for us as healthcare practitioners and maybe the, the public at large, to just know what are the key things that we look at whenever we are looking at now the, the, the insurance claims. So briefly on uh, health insurance. So at the moment, um, based on the IRA data, so 3% of the Kenyans uh, have, uh, have insurance. So this is now all forms of insurance. But now moving specifically to uh, health insurance, so we have only 17% of the Kenyans having some form of uh, prepaid uh, health insurance. So this is data from uh, national health accounts at uh, 2015. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, out of the 17%, so the biggest chunk of the, uh, the population that's insured, so 88% is covered by NHIF, while only 11% is covered now by the private health insurance. Uh, so it's still, um, I mean, it's a, it's a drop in the ocean, uh, bearing, uh, I'm sure some of us know, um, are contributing in one way, basically out of pocket spending. So we are having to chip in uh, medical bills here and there, our aunties, our relatives, yeah. So we are still not uh, there. And uh, I think it's one of the main agenda that really the government needs to look at, uh, like how can we ensure that at least, uh, you know, Kenyans have some form of insurance so that at the end of the day, you know, we are able to, to stop the out of pocket spending that, uh, that is currently happening. Uh, so in terms of the number of insurance companies that are uh, existing in Kenya at the moment, so there are 31. Um, so generally, the business has been growing. Uh, so if you compare 2014 up until now, so in terms of premiums, so premiums is basically the amount of money that people contribute uh, to get uh, health insurance. So in 2014, it was about 25 billion. Uh, so as at 2019, it was about 42.4. So that's basically a 58% increment. But then again, it's still, um, uh, what this slide just tells us, it's, I mean, there's still some room uh, for improvement in terms of people getting coverage. Uh, so, but the, the other unfortunate bit is, even in spite of the premiums increasing, what we are seeing is, uh, is that the, most of the medical insurance business in Kenya at the moment, they are not profit, uh, they are not making profit. And I will tell you in the subsequent slides why that is happening. So this is just some of the insurance companies that are, uh, that, uh, you know, share their, their financials uh, last year. So or basically you can see what is in red. Uh, that those are some of the insurance companies that, uh, you know, didn't underwrite uh, a profit. So I'll now dive to the challenges that are uh, facing uh, medical insurance uh, business. And as I, I had uh, alluded before, uh, one of the greatest challenges we are having is, is the low insurance penetration. So as I said before, uh, looking at now the, um, basically 17% of Kenyans having uh, you know, form of insurance. So we still have about 83% of Kenyans who are not insured yeah. So that is one of the biggest uh, challenge. And uh, if you ask uh, people why that, that is the case, so they will tell you, of course, that your premiums are high. Now looking at now the, the private health insurance, so the premiums are high. So most Kenyans, are, you know, they don't consider insurance as a priority. They would prefer to have that kidogo money that they have and maybe buy a shamba or, you know, uh, use that resources elsewhere. And then the other challenge that we've seen, of course, there is a limited marketing of insurance, especially now in the interior parts uh, of Kenya. And uh, people don't even know what insurance is. So if you have to put it into perspective, like looking at, you know, now looking at uh, our, uh, in the villages, so how many people have even NHIF? I'm sure it's, it's really a handful and convincing that person over there to, just uh, you know, pay up 500 per month for uh, NHIF. You know, it becomes 
a challenge. So if you're now to tell them to pay, let's say maybe 20,000 a year for a, a private medical cover, then you know the, the discussion changes um, uh, at that, yeah? Uh, now, the other, other challenges also which uh, we are facing uh, as a business is, you know, and it's not, a, it's not only a Kenyan issue. So the healthcare costs are increasing. Uh, even globally. So, of course, we have the, the technology that has come in, you have the advanced procedures, uh, you know, uh, all that at the, at the end of the day, they cost money. And what that does is, so if an insurance company is paying out a lot in terms of, uh, of claims, eventually that cost is going to be passed to the, to the member. And then what that does is, of course, the premiums are going to be too, too, uh, too expensive and you'll find people dropping out uh, of cover. Um, the other biggest challenge I also wanted to mention and uh, to, I'll speak more of it is basically fraud and abuse and uh, really what that does to, to the medical business and not only in Kenya, uh, even, uh, even globally. Uh, then, of course, uh, the adverse selection, this is basically means that, uh, you know, I get a cover, I get a medical cover because I am sick. So I know maybe, uh, maybe I'm, I'm scheduled for a surgery, let's say maybe the next six months. So what I do, I try to get into a private uh, cover so that by the time I'm sick, then the medical, my medical cover kicks in. So that is also one of the challenges that we have. But of course, we have mechanisms in place to ensure that, you know, we are able to scrutinize uh, these applications. Uh, so then I'll move to, uh, I can skip this slide, um, or maybe I can just br briefly just brush through it. Um, so basically, as I said before, so healthcare costs are increasing. And for, you know, there is, uh, if, you are, if you are to look at currently the, the profile, uh, the uh, disease profile of the population, we are having a lot of um, chronic diseases. So your diabetes, uh, your hypertension, your, your uh, COPD and all that. And what you realize, the cost of managing these diseases are quite high. And uh, of course, even as people age, you know, the more you age, the more you are, you are now more propense to now getting ill. And of course, you uh, being on long-term treatment and such. So the, whatever we are seeing in the West, unfortunately, it is now, it's now becoming a, a reality in Kenya. Um, then more specifically now, looking at now in the healthcare uh, platform. So what are these uh, drivers uh, of cost? Eh? So as I mentioned before, the aging population, we have our un unhealthy lifestyle. So people are more and more, they're no longer doing exercises. Uh, you know, people are consuming alcohol and, uh, and all that. So that at the end of the day, it translates now to, to the non-communicable disease, which are, uh, which are related to unhealthy lifestyle uh, uh, diseases. Advance in technology, so you have you are now your PET scans that have come in, you have your MRIs and all that at the end of the day, it adds up to the cost of care. Uh, evolving care models, I wouldn't really talk much about that. So procedures that were used to be a three or four day admission nowadays are being done as a day case. So of course that, um, you know, it improves outcome, but of course it's tied to the cost uh, of care. Uh, then, uh, of course, the other part is really insured behavior. So if I know I have a medical card, I am more likely to go to a hope, you know, to maybe a, a, tire, a tire one hospital and, you know, incur more costs. And now also looking at it from the provider end, you, what we also realize if, if I go to a, a hospital and I, I show my, my private medical card, there is now that, in, we see that incentive you know, for, for the provider to over service, to send me to the lab, to send me to do this, to give me expensive drugs and such. It's, it's not, I'm not saying, uh, I'm not calling names, but it's something that we actually pick from our end. Uh, I had alluded to fraud. Uh, so fraud really, it's one of the biggest challenges that we get uh, as a business and um, so basically, uh, on us scoping it globally, so 6% of all the global healthcare costs are uh, attributed to fraud. So US data, it was stating about 260 billion uh, is spent on, you know, is lost through fraud. Eh? So putting that into perspective, it's really a huge amount of money. And uh, really, if, and it's something that we really have control if we are to know what are, you know, what are, what is fraud, what is fraud and abuse, and what it is that you and I can do 
to curb this uh, issue. So I, I wanted to focus more on just this concept and um, the concept of fraud and abuse. Uh, you know, sometimes we can, we think probably uh, what I am doing maybe as a practitioner, possibly maybe I am helping out, uh, I'm helping out a client, maybe, you know, to just ensure that whichever ailment that they have, eh, it can go through and, you know, an insurance company can pay. Probably on one way, in one way or another, I might be, I might feel like I am assisting the client, yeah, because I know, of course, uh, the insurer will pay, yeah, but if you are to look at now exactly what that is, eh, so that exactly is fraud and abuse, eh? uh, so putting it in um, uh, concept, uh, I mean, um, as a concept of fraud, so it means definitely like you're trying to obtain a benefit or uh, advantage related to the operation of uh, insurance scheme. So here you have somebody who, who wants to get to gain an advantage. So this is probably the, the client or you call them the, the patient. And then now here you have somebody who is, who is having to pay for this. So this now uh, is the insurance company. So in one way or the other, you know, you're trying to, you know, to get a benefit that a, a client was not covered for. How I usually, you know, just put it, you know, just uh, simply say it is, for example, I have, I have paid for a hundred book for a service. So there is no way I would want to get 120, uh, a benefit worth 120. So basically that's what insurance works. So you pay a certain amount to get coverage for a certain, uh, you know, scope of services. So if you want to get 120, it means there is somebody who, is, who will have to, to pay for the other 20 uh, that was overspent. So basically that's a, that's a definition of fraud. Uh, in terms of now abuse, so simply say it's basically you are, you are practicing, um, you are practicing, whatever you're practicing is really inconsistent uh, with sound physical, business, medical practices, and it unnecessarily results to a cost to the payer. Uh, then my next slide, I'll just take you through what are some of the items that we consider as fraud and abuse. So uncovered services. So here is, for example, somebody is not in, uh, somebody is not covered for, um, let's say, fertility treatment. And then what now the healthcare provider is, they maybe give me a diagnosis, uh, which more or less, uh, you know, you try to make the diagnosis to be payable, to appear like, you know, it's payable. And then what that happens is, is then the insurer, if they're not uh, diligent enough, they, you might find that uh, they will pay. So that is uh, uncovered services. So upcoding simply means is, for example, you did, um, you went and did uh, a certain procedure maybe, and then you now, whatever you write in the medical report, you, you represent another procedure which is expensive so that you can be paid uh, accordingly. Misrepresenting, this is, I think I had given a, an initial, um, initial example where you, 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 don't, you don't give me all the, the correct facts for, 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 for me to make a decision, the decision as, the, as the insurer. Uh, and bundling claims. So this is, for example, you, let's say we have like a package that costs, let's say, 100,000 and you have already agreed on the 100,000. So what the provider or the hospital tries to do is to now break down that bundle and now start charging me, let's say 25K over here, 30K over here, which then eventually maybe it sums up to let's say 150K. So this goes against the, the initial agreement uh, that we had. Double billing is just simply said, uh, you, I went for a certain procedure, but then you bill it twice so that at least you can, uh, you can be paid uh, accordingly. Uh, miscoding, uh, this is basically you are, you are giving a certain code, uh, a, a disease, a certain code, so that you are able to, to get uh, more, more payments. Uh, not rendered services, so here is basically, this is uh, what we usually call like uh, in procurement, whereby you are supplying air. So it means basically um, you bill me for service that you never, you never did. So what that uh, brings through is uh, those what you are calling uh, phantom invoices. And medical unnecessary services. So this is actually what the, the commonest um, challenge that we get with claims. So maybe somebody has a URTI, 
uh, you know, your common cold, but then they go in, you find there's a hemogram, there's a CRP, there is a ESR, you know, all those lab tests, and then you find like five prescriptions. So when you're looking at that claim, you just come and you realize maybe whatever was that was given really does not does not tally with with the diagnosis. So eventually, what that is what that does is is really uh, increasing the the healthcare costs. Uh, then prescribing specific brand name uh, drugs. So this is basically maybe you're in uh, you're in uh, agreement with a pharmaceutical company, and uh, whereby now you you agree, okay, if you prescribe this uh, uh, brand X, I uh, will give you, let's say, 10%. So, of course, that happens, you get your 10%, so you are both happy, but, of course, the insurer will be now uh, the one to, to bear the cost. Um, so, my next slide, really, I, I wanted uh, to t uh, us to just learn in terms of uh, what, are, what is a policy, so what is a medical policy and some key definitions that are there that actually bring a lot of um, a lot of you know conflict between the insurance company and now the the healthcare provider. So what we need to know is uh, each and every each and every if I can call it a company or policy, it's specific. So when I go and purchase a certain cover, I pay my 100 shillings. Looking uh, going back to my initial. Uh, example, I'm paying 100 shillings and I'm told, uh, so Jane, you're covered for A, B, C, D, E. And that's, all that is put in a, in, a, in a policy document and that is what I know I am, I am covered for. So each and every policy is unique. So they are- uh, Dr. Jane? Yes? Sorry, you have less than 10 minutes to yes, finalize. I, I am winding up. All right, thank you. Yeah, I have like two minutes. I just wanted us to learn this policy, these terms, which we, at least for us to, to be familiar with them. So, yeah, so what I was saying is, so I buy, uh, I buy a policy and there are those terms and conditions that guide what I am covered for. So one of the key uh, terminology which we encounter is a chronic condition. So simply say the chronic condition is it's a disease uh, or illness or injury that has no cure which is recurrent, can lead to permanent disability. Uh, of course, it requires you to be monitored, you know, uh, even after the treatment, not only when you are sick, but even, uh, even after that. Uh, then another concept uh, is about pre-existing condition. So pre-existing, what it, what it usually looks at when you are covered. So if I buy my cover today and I have, um, I may have disclosed an ailment or not, not have disclosed an ailment. So what, the insurance company will look at is this ail was this ailment known before you are covered or was it or was it known after you are covered so this definition it means um, you can you can have a pre-existing condition even before uh, before you are covered and what that means is when we are now paying the claim we will pay it to to this uh, benefit uh, that you had uh, the last two are basically waiting periods so whenever you are purchasing your cover, there are usually waiting periods. So you are maybe told uh, for chronic diseases, you have to wait, let's say, for one year, or for maternity, you have to wait for a year. So we have others which, let's say, for cancer, you wait for two years. So it's always good for you to know uh, those waiting periods so that uh, you are, uh, whenever you go to seek services, you, you are also advised on that. Uh, another item is exclusions. So when you look at, um, for medical insurance companies, what they usually look at is they price a risk. So whatever is not priced uh, is usually like now these exclusions. What that means is uh, you're not covered for uh, certain uh, conditions. And this, uh, from their perspective, they usually look at, um, so is the, is the, is the, is the ailment, uh, are you able to insure that ailment? Is the ailment self-inflicting? Right, uh, so, and these are some of the exclusions that we don't cover for. So family planning, cosmetic and beauty treatment, genetic testing, STDs, but a bit of a disclaimer. So currently we are having, uh, you know, members coming back to us and telling, paying an extra premium for them to be covered. So in as much as there are exclusions, you still have that provision of paying an extra premium for you to, to get the, the, the coverage. Yeah, so that is it from my end. I'm not so sure. Uh, Dr. Rona, is uh, Julia still there? I want... 
Yeah. Yes, Jane, I'm still there. Yes, so maybe you can take maybe one minute to just take the team through the our PI cover and what it entails. Okay, no problem. Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll just I'll try to be as brief as possible. Uh, so what happens is uh, a professional indemnity basically it's a uh, liability cover that you normally give for all professions that includes doctors, lawyers, architects, and all that. So for this specific course, for this specific case, we'll be talking about doctors. So what does a professional indemnity cover? It basically provides compensation for doctors in the events they suffer a financial loss as a result of what the court might actually declare as negligence, errors, or omission in the course of discharging their own duty, which might uh, basically lead to a patient suffering. Either in, it may be in a form of death or a permanent disability of that sort. So what happens is here at Jubilee, we have uh, various covers for all medical practitioners and uh, it normally depends on, uh, the premium is normally dependent on basically the speciality. So in uh, this particular case, the reason why we actually have, uh, the reason why we will, uh, we will, the reason why it's actually compulsory for doctors who have this particular PI cover, it's because I know it's a requirement. It's a, it's a requirement basically for you to get a license. You must have a professional indemnity cover. Then number two, also the scope of cover, which is wider. And uh, what it covers actually as a doctor is uh, the court awards and the judgments. This will be against the doctor towards the patient or the third party. Fees and expenses, so you also cover that. It also covers the uh, defense costs. Yeah, I think uh, what I, I can also add is uh, what happens in this particular cover is uh, it's not limited to Kenya only. In the event you have uh, clinics outside outside uh, the territorial scope of Kenya, and uh, there's a claim lodged by a patient in a particular country which is not in Kenya. This actually cover will will actually uh, will actually be useful. Invite any questions? Yes. So I'm thinking we can. Yes. So yes, that comes to the end of our presentation. Uh, maybe uh, Doc Roda will do. Can we take in some questions? Yes, we can. Thank you very much, okay. uh, Dr. Nyapara and uh, Julius, for taking us through that very briefly. Uh, I don't know if there's any question. I'm not seeing any question in the chat box regarding insurance, but mm -hmm. I believe the participants have learned something and have heard something. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A, especially regarding insurance and how to go about uh, professional indemnity, please remember to put it there so that the team can be able to address that. Yes. So uh, Jane, my question is with regards to medical legal issues. If I have a professional indemnity cover and I've taken one, mm -hmm. are there cases that you don't, you will not cover me? Are there exclusion criteria for the professional indemnity cover to the professionals in this group? Yes, uh, let, let me answer that. <clears throat> what happens is we have some exclusions which uh, basically includes uh, malicious, if, if at all it's something that is actually legal, or there's a malicious intent from the doctor, that is an outright exclusion. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you very much for that. Uh, any other question maybe from the participants. Anyone would like to know more about, uh, there's a personal question and somebody is asking, how can I subscribe to this Jubilee insurance cover and how much is it per month? Maybe that one you can type the answer there for them. And uh, somebody, the same person is also asking, is it applicable to all Kenyans, to Kenyans of all caliber? 
Uh, Jane, maybe you can briefly just say whether it's applicable to all Kenyans. So they are, they are talking about medical insurance cover, right? Yes, Jubilee insurance cover. Yes, we, yes. so we, ha we cover everyone. Uh, so basically what we can do, maybe I, I, could, uh, I could share my contacts. So if you, can, if you have any query, I could uh, gladly assist you. Okay. We have cover for all Kenyans, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, so I'm not seeing any more question on insurance, but thank you very much, Dr. Jen Yapara and uh, Julius Mwangi for finding time. We appreciate. Thank Unfortunately, you. this year we could not have the physical symposium as we had last year, but uh, yes. thank you very much for finding time to join the online platform. We appreciate you. Thank I'd you. like to give a final question to, to Dr. Walong and Dr. Kimani. Uh, Dr. Long, there's a question about biometric identification. No, sorry, this is for Dr. Kimani. Dr. Joseph Kimani, uh, what would be the benefit of biometric identification in forensic? And for Dr. Long, there's a question about who should follow up the results once it's done, the DNA and the autopsy results. There's also another question for Dr. Long about what override... Uh, address medical legal need overriding relative consent. Yes, so Dr. Walong, maybe you can address that, where the medical legal need overrides the relative's consent. Right, uh, thank, thank you. And uh, fortunately, uh, Professor Mushiri is my teacher and she has, uh, has properly mentioned that actually medical legal autopsies as defined by law means that the state is requiring it and uh, being the, the governance is a collective societal tool to create uh, order and of course to create a lot of harmony. Therefore, those ones will override uh, relative consent and I should have reiterated that. So, so when the, and, and that is why we really want the National Corona Service Act to be active because it will clear a lot of this Currently, we do have uh, uh, police officers who may not be too sure, and they may guide people down a path that is not correct. But we have to, for us, we have to stick with the, the law. Sometimes we find, for example, the relative may be the perpetrator, and we see that a lot in child abuse cases. So there are many reasons why the request by the appropriate state authority will override the, the, the family consent. But in clinical cases where there's no, uh, where, where the forensic need is not there, then we definitely need to talk to the family. Thank you, Dr. Okay, thank you for that response. Um, I'm not sure whether Dr. Kimani is still with us to address the issue of biometric, but uh, maybe Dr. Alon, you'd like to attempt it? Although I can see Dr. Kimani right there, uh, he's even smiling. <laughs> Maybe let him handle this. He's the expert there. Yes, Dr. Kimani. Yes, yes. The, I, I've attempted to answer most of the questions in the chat. Eh? I don't yes. know whether you need to go through them. Or... No, 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 that's okay. Somebody is asking about benefits of biometric, biometric identification in forensic uh, medicine. In forensic? Yes, are we, are we there yet or do we still have uh, a few years to go? Well, I think the, the, there was some attempt on this, uh, is it to do my number to also incorporate biometric details. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, I may not be the best suited to answer the question, but I, I remember there was a, an attempt to include DNA to be part of uh, the specific features that will be taken when uh, somebody is registering biometrically, but uh, that is a very humongous task. You, you can imagine the cost implication and the data, it is quite humongous. Even the, the, the largest economies like the US and the, the rest of the other countries have not been able to achieve uh, putting DNA data for every single person, every person in, in, their, in their population. So I think the only thing they have achieved is to have what we call a criminal DNA data bank, where every convict gives a DNA profile and it is taken up to, it is put in the database. But I think for every single member of the population, that is quite ambitious. Okay, mm. thank you. 
thank you very much. This brings us to the end of Medical Legal Symposium. Thank you, Dr. Joseph Kimani. Thank you, Dr. Edwin Walong. Thank you, Dr. Jen Nyapara and Julius Mwangi. We appreciate you and uh, we appreciate that you found time to join us in this new uh, way of doing things. We're very glad that uh, throughout the years, you've always been there for us. So thank you from Kenyatta National Hospital. We appreciate the work that you do and uh, we wish you well. Asante ni sana. And to, the, yes, and to the participants, we'd like to all thank you for bearing with us. It's been two hours of a lot of learning. I hope we've all appreciated what every team does. From the time we started the Medical Legal Symposium, you've met different professions and they're all talking about the different work that they do with regards to medical legal issues in Kenya. So I really hope it's been an informative uh, four weeks and that you've been able to learn something and uh, it was beneficial to you. We'd like to thank you all for finding time and repeatedly joining the session, not just for the CPD points, but also for the learning. And we're excited that you've been active participants and uh, we hope when we organize a similar session in future, you'll also turn up for the learning uh, part. So once again, if you're in the county, please remember to advocate to have a pathologist in your area. And uh, another learning point that we learned from Dr. Kimani, if you forget every, anything else, don't forget about the sample collection, the documentation, and also that formalin destroys DNA. So let, let's take the sample first, the DNA sample, before we preserve um, the, the items or the specimen in formalin. And also one thing we also learned uh, from Dr. Kimani is about the issue of the processes to follow. Do, when we are collecting data especially, and the learning points that they have had as a division or as a department. So one of the things we learned is about remains, how to preserve remains, the environmental factors, uh, the command and the command at the scene. Uh, not everybody should be able to make decisions, but we should have one central command and the team, the experts should be led to do the work with the correct PPE. Also the issue of uh, handling emotional relatives, how to do it very well. And also do not put another body where you've just removed another body before cleaning the area and uh, making it uh, DNA free, if there's such a word. And there's this of, of resource mobilization and how we handle the media. So thank you very much. Issue of DNA, remember that we were told about blood swabs, how to collect the sample from the finger and the toenails, from the femur, from the molar. So let's be keen wherever we are working in and let's refer patients to the correct experts. Maybe Dr. Kimani, you can tell us where you're located. If anyone wants DNA, I've seen quite a few questions about DNA. Where can people come for DNA testing? Yeah, uh, we are located at the Kenyatta National Hospital grounds, uh, opposite the Sisters Mest, past uh, Camry at the National Public Health Labs, your fine garment chemist uh, department we are located within uh, that, that, that facility. And we also have uh, branches in Kisumu and Mombasa, and the people can also get their services, uh, similar services from the two branches. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, from Dr. Walong, we learned that history is very important. History is very important. We got a very interesting case, or the case, case two, was it case two or case three, about the baby and the Clinical history was missed out, very, a very crucial clinical history was missed out. So clinical history is very important and uh, it's one of the things that we need to document very well for the pathologist to be able to know what to, how to go about the case. Because some of these cases turn out to be medical legal issues and uh, when you're called to court, you're not able to, your clinical history does not tie up with the autopsy findings. We also learned the importance of having a pathologist in every area, every hospital, not in the MOG, but in every facility up to all levels. So we encourage more of the listeners, if you're able to join pathology and come and do your master's in pathology, Karibuni Sana, we need more of you out there. Uh, issues of task shifting, we've heard about verbal autopsy. It's not yet, uh, it's, it happens, but it's not uh, uh, liable free 
you're not very well protected. So if you can do, if you can get a pathologist, the better. And also as a medical officer, as you're doing the autopsy out there in the county, please make sure that you're well protected. Uh, not just in terms of PPE, but also in terms of uh, your cover, indemnity cover, and that when you stand in a court of law, you stand by your word. Please know what you're looking out for. Let's not just do uh, a shoddy job without looking properly at the autopsies that we're doing. Uh, from Ms. Dr. Jen Nyapara and uh, Julius, we learned about insurance, reason for poor penetration. We've learned that there are a lot of Kenyans who don't have insurance. Even just an HIF cover is still very poor. And that's one of the things that is a key driver. Finance is a key driver for health. So if we don't have the money to come to hospital, it affects the, your access to care. So we also learned about that. And also we learned about professional indemnity and the importance of it. So I'd like to urge all of us as we renew our indemnity covers to remember to take, uh, as we renew our licenses to remember to take indemnity cover. So thank you very much. And uh, tomorrow, just an alert, tomorrow our session will be from 10 in the morning to 12 midday. So tomorrow we are celebrating, the world is celebrating the second World Patient Safety Day. And our theme this year is health worker safety, a priority for patient safety. We'll be having uh, different partners and players coming into play to have a conversation about health worker safety tomorrow. So please join us between 10 to 12 p.m. We will not have an afternoon session. This is the session that we'll be having and I hope you'll all be able to share the message uh, with your colleagues. If you're not able to join, let your colleague join. Let's hear what is in place by the government with regards to health worker safety. So Karibuni Sana Kesho and uh, have a good afternoon. On Friday, we still have the experience sharing, uh, still same time, 10 to 12. We will be having the experience sharing sessions in managing COVID-19 disease. So we'll be hearing from the experts again about what's going on on the ground. Why are the numbers going down? That's an interesting conversation that we'll have on Friday. So welcome to tomorrow's session. Have a good evening and uh, bye. Thank you once again. Thank you. Bye.